Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Um, we're going to get started here. We'll actually get started on, on time. So, um, so welcome to the reality of Carbon Projects panel, where we'll talk about how projects are making a difference. Uh, despite what sometimes makes the headlines and talk shows, carbon offset projects are serving a critical role in communities around the globe to make the world a better place for our kids and our grandkids. Today I have a great group of panelists who can share their stories about how these projects are truly making a difference. So with us today, we have Rosendo Perez from ICICO. We have Elise Alele Ferme with Pro Natura Mexico. And on the end, we have Danny Warren with Great Bear Carbon Credit Limited Partnership. I'm Jim Carruth, and I'm head of marketing and communications with Incubex. We've listed voluntary carbon offset futures um, with our partner at Nodal Exchange, and we also run um, the Voluntary Climate Marketplace, uh, a spot market for carbon offset projects. The timing for successful and known uh, projects is more critical than ever, I think, as everybody knows, but um, I, I saw a couple of really interesting and disturbing uh, facts uh, lately. The consumption of coal last year hit a record of 8.5 billion metric tons. Um, crude oil production hit a record 12 million barrels per day in 2023, and that's up 158 percent from 2008. So these projects really are absolutely necessary in the drive towards net zero, and um, the projects that our panelists work on are absolutely essential to this goal. But they also offer much more to the communities that are actually doing the hard work. So today, this panel will discuss the reality on the ground and give us a picture of just how um, projects are making a real impact. So we're just gonna jump into it, and I'd like, um, maybe we'll start with you, Rosendo, um, to talk a little bit about you know, a description of the work that you're doing and the projects um, that your organizations do. Okay, thank you, uh, Jim. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, thank you to uh, Climate Action Reserve for the, for the invitation. Um, as Jim said, I work for ICICO. ICICO stands for Integrator of Indigenous and Campesino Communities uh, of Oaxaca. This is in Spanish. Uh, we have a very, um, I mean, I want to say a very large project. It's not a, uh, as large as other projects in Mexico, but we include 16 communities that work under the Carbioin initiative. Carbioin stands for Indigenous Carbon Sequestration, Water Capture, and Biodiversity Monitoring. That's in Spanish. Uh, we, we look at carbon offsets as an integral part of ecosystems. And uh, the project is aimed to increase the value of uh, ecosystem uh, services. Basically, what we want to do is bring, bring in profit for communities by selling uh, carbon offsets, but also um, promoting other benefits that the, commu the communities have and also the ecosystems provide to the communities and, and um, the ecosystems in, in Oaxaca region, and Oaxaca state, sorry. Thanks very much, Elise. Hi, everyone. Thanks. N nice to see you all. Um, my name is uh, Elisa Lely Ferme, as men uh, Kim, uh, Jim mentioned. Sorry. Uh, I work for the Por Natura Mexico, a Mexican environmental NGO, which has over 42 years of experience um, working on nature conservation across the country. Uh, we have uh, five other sister uh, organizations, other Por Naturas, that cover, uh, together we cover the, the whole uh, territory of Mexico, basically. Um, we've, Pronatura has been very active in the, the carbon markets uh, for over f 15 years, uh, starting collaborations with a number of partners, including with ICICO, uh, when the market was just really starting in, in Mexico. And since 2019, we've been collaborating with, the, with USAID and the private sector, as well as WRI Mexico, in order to develop a um, large-scale large, large project called uh, Comunitario, CO2 com, uh, Comunitario, which is two words that bring together di uh, carbon dioxide and community. You know, our project is really in fo focused on building the capacities of local forest owners and uh, the project developers to bring a financing through carbon credits 
uh, for forest conservation. So we've been working in this project since 2019. We're ending this year. We've got a lot of things that we still want to do this year. Um, it's a, this, I appreciate this opportunity to speak today so we can share some of the lessons learned that we've had. And uh, it's a large project working over 150,000 hectares in Mexico and with 59 different communities. Um, and our, it has been quite a, of a pioneer project. We've had the, the fortune of collaborating with the Climate Action Reserve as well in different aspects of it, uh, especially in training, uh, training on the Mexican Forest Protocol. So a uh, general presentation of what we do. Yeah, thanks so much. And Danny, uh, why don't you tell us what, what you're doing up in Canada? Yeah, absolutely. So I, uh, I work for the Great Bear Carbon Credit Limited Partnership. Uh, our limited partnership is actually owned by an alliance of First Nations, so nine First Nations between the Great Bear Rainforest and Haida Gwaii uh, up in Canada. It's uh, north of Vancouver, just for geography's sake. Our nations actually came together in the 1990s, and um, we used to be called Turning Point, and now today we go under the name of Coastal First Nations Great Bear Initiative. The nations came together as an alliance to do government-to-government -government relations with the province of British Columbia, and back in uh, 2006 signed our first reconciliation agreement with the province, which listed several economic initiatives to benefit communities, to develop First Nations communities, but also work alongside our provincial government in terms of lands and water management. And then through, uh, through the Reconciliation 1.0 agreement birthed the uh, carbon projects that I work for today. And so I manage uh, sales and marketing partnerships for two offset projects to improve forest management avoidance projects um, on the coast. And again, for that's the uh, north central mid coast and Haida Gwaii are the project areas. Um, yes, I would say that you know, what's interesting about our projects is that we are entirely indigenous owned. So we don't have you know, outside investors that come into play or that we kind of share proceeds with. Um, we have our, in, in, in our government agreements with the province, that 65% of revenues are required to be used towards stewardship initiatives and community. But typically it's more than that, and that's really just the high demands and the needs of stewardship that we're seeing today. Uh, outside of you know, the carbon world, our nations are running a lot of different types of programs, and I say one of the biggest ones right now is the Marine Protected Area Network, which is uh, also referred to as the Great Bear Sea. And so what this is looking at is um, areas up and down the north central mid coast, and um, it's protecting areas, conserving areas, but also allocating you know, resources between communities existing fisheries and and so the aim to be is to restore waters that have become depleted over time um, there is 17 different habitat types of areas within the plan and about 200 species that are covered with about five different types of species that are more at risk um, on the end high end of that salmon being one of them I'm sure something we've all heard about at some point or another along the coast but yeah I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Yeah, that's great. Well, maybe I'll, I'll just turn it back over to you and, and um, just ask a little bit more about, you know, kind of what does this mean in terms of the benefits or, you know, jobs on the ground, um, that, that type of thing. What are some of the uh, kind of the key takeaways or metrics that you're looking at in terms of involving the communities um, to, uh, to get involved? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I mentioned before that the majority of revenues do, co do go towards stewardship activities. I think one of the bigger programs that have benefit is a marine plan partnership program, which is part of that marine protected area network I mentioned. So offset revenues will be are used and have been used for a number of years to support that plan. And so what that is, is um, 17 different First Nations along the coast that work with the province of British Columbia to uh, put in plan, sorry, put in place marine protected areas. And again, plan between government, NGOs, existing fisheries, so it is commercial, has uh, equal say in that to what they need as well, and to continue business inside and outside First Nations communities. Um, as well, Coastal Guardian Watchmen is a really big one that benefits from our carbon project. And Coastal Guardian Watchmen are a different group within each community, and their role is to protect the lands and waters. So essentially like rangers, a group committed to each community. In 2022, one of our communities actually got um, government status as park rangers, which is a really big move for community. And so they're able to have the same authorities and levels that a Canadian park ranger would have. Uh, beyond that, every community still has established their own guardian watchman, and uh, and they do different types of programs. You know, we'll be monitoring, sorry, monitoring lands, of course, 
um, you know, providing security protection for the areas, but they're also doing, you know, we have a green crab invasion along the coast that um, is, I know spreads along the American coast as well. And so, you know, they're constantly trying to help with that. Uh, there has been in the past as well the uh, grizzly bear ban hunt. So um, over the course of several years in the, uh, the 2010s, we'll say those years, um, uh, First Nations came together with NGOs and, and private industry to monitor grizzly bears in the Great Bear Rainforest. And the data between the two was able to give us an idea of how many bears exist in the area and, um, and the different types. You know, some of the communities have names. They know these, these species well. They know their bears well. Uh, but beyond that, what happened was with all the data put together, in 2018, there was actually a grizzly bear ban hunt put in place for the Great Bear Rainforest. And again, that was an uh, alliance between government, NGOs, and First Nations. Um, but a lot of this work being supported by our, our carbon project. Beyond that, there are several youth and, uh, sorry, youth programs, summer programs. Um, there's been a couple big houses put up in communities as well, again, from offset revenues. And... Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank yeah, you. that's great. Thanks. Elise, um, uh, why don't you talk a little bit about kind of what you're seeing on the ground in terms of community, community benefits? Sure, thank you. Um, no, so the project, since we started in 2019, uh, a lot of the focus has been on building that capacity, uh, both of forest owners, so forest, forest communities, especially in their understanding of the, the Mexican forest protocol in order to uh, develop forest inventories, uh, you, thanks to people within that same community, being able to follow the steps of the project. And I think that's been a really important uh, benefit of the project has been that um, the way the project has accompanied uh, these different forest communities w with the help of project developers. No, And uh, Pornatura itself doesn't, isn't a project developer. We work with uh, seven other uh, project, uh, project developers uh, that have, um, w we've been able to strengthen their capacity as well. Some ha that started in 2019 uh, were starting in the market world, in the carbon world. So we, we've been able to create a sort of a, a community uh, and to generate like best practices as well in terms of the development of these kind of projects, which in turn uh, translates when these projects arrive to the moment where credits are issued into this additional income for forest communities. No, I think uh, an important focus of the project has been to work with um, uh, communities in, in Mexico that have uh, forest management practices, that already have a, a forest management plan, and the idea is, is to bring an additional income to these, these communities so they can for, continue within a, the, to, to practice improve forest management and even create, develop more practices in, towards the conservation of those, uh, of those uh, forests. I think it's very important to mention that in Mexico, a, a large part of, a, uh, of forests are conserved by communities. And so working with communities is absolutely the, the way to go. No, there's no way around it. And it's actually a, a, an important way to foment um, conservation, but also a sustainable development and, and uh, to provide um, a decent work opportunities for, for communities in, in, in these more marginalized areas in Mexico. So one of the important um, outcomes of the project so far is that we've been able to benefit indirectly over 30,000 people through the, the generation of carbon credits and through the, the, uh, this generation of, um, of income from, from the carbon credits. I think it's, it's also important to be realistic about what it means. I think the market in Mexico is, is also growing. Uh, there's a, there's it's relatively new when we think about it in 2019 when we started the project there there wasn't much of a market indicator there wasn't a lot of uh, momentum uh, in the market and as we have grown uh, up until now the market has taken up a huge momentum especially in Mexico and so the this project takes they take a time to reach the moment where uh, we're actually generating carbon credits so it's required a lot of patience you know, from, from the, the side of communities, from different actors involved. Uh, I think, I would say one of the biggest benefits is that we've grown as this community of the project in terms of our, uh, everybody's understanding of the market, how these projects are developed, and how we can 
uh, even generate greater best practices uh, in the sector, taking into account the impact that they have uh, on the ground. I think, um, of course, the, the, project, the projects as we uh, work to develop the forest inventories, they, we generate uh, green jobs for the, for the communities where, we're, where the projects are located. The coordinators of these projects um, are, are also strongly involved in every step of the way so that the, the community itself is, mm, it, it's their project, no? So we, we have to make sure that we are working in a way that the, the project is, uh, has, has that, under, the, the, the coordinator in the community in general has that understanding no, of, of the market and the different project steps. Um, something that we're starting to see is that the income of these carbon credits is sparking new conversations about how to develop a local economy based on uh, these revenues. It's still, I find, an early stage because we're starting to get the, the income from these, these carbon credits. We're in, but these conversations are starting and, and what's impulsing it is these new, uh, this new type of, of income that the, these communities have not, had not seen uh, to this moment, no? Mm, that's great, thanks. And, and Rosendo, what, what are you seeing in terms of benefits and, and um, kind of the attributes of these programs? Okay, um, just before starting talking about uh, the benefits, uh, a little bit of context. Um, as I said, we're an integrator of communities. The communities are members to the organization, which means that the communities have the power to decide over the project, but also over the organization. So we are kind of in a special case in the Mexico organizational context, uh, basically because all the communities participating in Carbio In project are, um, um, they, they have all the power to decide what's gonna happen uh, with the project on their communities at any, at, at any point on time but also they can decide over uh, what the organization is going to do. Uh, the organization's goal is to uh, provide the most benefits to the communities, especially those uh, community members that we, we have. And uh, we can divide the benefits into two main um, aspects. Uh, the first one will be the environmental uh, benefits. Uh, let's do some um, context as well. Um, uh, Climate Action Reserve, Mexico Forest Protocol on, only issues credits only issue credit, sorry, uh, when we can prove that the forest is growing beyond what uh, the forest will grow on a natural, um, n a natural basis. Uh, so in that, in that regard, uh, we require the communities to uh, develop additional activities that will increase the, um, the forest or increase the growth uh, within the forests in order to um, create more, create more or, or have more issue, um, credits to be sold in the, in the market. Mm. Um, so that creates jobs. Uh, in some communities we have between 20 and 40 uh, seasonal jobs and around five to seven uh, permanent mm. jobs. So basically we are, we are increasing the number of jobs um, available to the community and also we are trying very hard to reduce the immigration rates uh, that has become a very, very big problem in some communities in Mexico. And on the other side, we have uh, the social benefits. I, I can say that these social benefits are pretty much tailored to the community. What we do is perform, in, uh, we perform uh, planning workshops with the communities and we assess uh, the challenges uh, they are facing at, at the moment. And uh, we propose, or uh, with help of community members, we propose uh, certain activities in order to uh, overcome these challenges. Um, and basically we have had communities that have invested heavy, heavily on health services. Uh, sadly, right now in Mexico, health, uh, the health public uh, service system, it's, it's very abandoned. Um, we don't have a huge investment from the government side uh, into that. We have communities that have also invested in education, uh, buying scholar materials for their students, uh, buying uh, equipment and computers, et cetera, for the communities. And um, also in public um, services like um, water, um, especially water infrastructure uh, for some of the communities, but also um, taking care of water provision. Uh, let's, uh, I mean, just for a little context, most of these communities are living within the forest. They are, um, they, they, they own, which means that um, access to services are, it's quite limited there, so. 
basically communities are trying to use um, the proceeds for carbon offsets to overcome um, social um, and pretty much infrastructural challenges that they, they, they face. So basically what we do is we help these communities decide uh, what they should invest the money on and uh, we present those as, as uh, the benefits of the project for the communities. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it sounds like, uh, you know, one of the key uh, takeaways from that is just having ownership, you know, like everybody is really actually um, invested <coughs> locally into the project. So um, that's great. So um, what initiatives or incentive programs are working or, you know, what, what are you seeing that actually generates really tangible results beyond that? And maybe I'll just flip it back to you, Rosendo. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Um, and again, during working with communities, uh, performing these planning workshops, we have seen a lot of similar challenges across uh, the communities. So what we decided to do is to integrate those challenges and, and try to come up with uh, lines of action from the, from the technical side, from, from ECO's technical side. And we created a um, regional level climate change strategy, that's how we name it, or um, RCCS in English or ERCC in Spanish. Uh, basically, what we want to do is to provide uh, viable options for the communities to overcome those challenges, but uh, from a very technical and also scientific approaches. We are working very closely with uh, Duke University, with University of North Carolina, uh, with the University of Antwerp, and uh, Mexico, uh, Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, the National Autonomous um, University of Mexico. And what we, what we are doing is uh, creating the scientific base uh, to address these challenges and these problematics that we have in communities and then propose activities that will help the community overcome these challenges. So we believe that we can prove um, and we can do a bigger, a bigger change by provide, providing long-term uh, solutions uh, to the communities than just using funds and activities that will uh, just patch some of the problems they have. Um, so basically we want to uh, address these problems for the long run and we understand and, and we are also kind of scary some, uh, scared sometimes that uh, the market will fall and then this, all of these good, good intention and goodwill initiatives will collapse with the, with the market. So we know that uh, we are fa facing a lot of challenges, especially because we're working with uh, nature-based solutions, mm -hmm. but we're doing our best effort to prove, and I, I think we are going to talk more about this in, uh, later, down the, later down the road, um, we are doing everything in our power to prove that these projects have uh, very high benefits for the communities, but also are, are tangi tangible benefits, and uh, it has integrity uh, built into the structure. Yeah. Um, uh, Danny, I'll flip it over to you. Like, so um, in terms of the, you know, incentives or initiatives that, um, uh, that you uh, create through the, uh, the programs, kind of like, what are you seeing that's working? How, uh, how did you guys structure that um, to, to start? Absolutely. Um, I mentioned before that the Marine Plan Partnership uh, for the North and Pacific Coast is one of the main programs funded by uh, offset revenues. And with that, it's, it's been amazing to see that program take place. So, you know, the group came together, I believe it was 2011. Marine plans were actually put out uh, back in 2015, 2016. And what we're seeing today is, is more support for these programs beyond even offset programs. And so there is a project for permanence put out by the government of Canada. And uh, 60 million of that will be going towards what I mentioned before, that Great Bear Sea project. Um, and... Um, and so that is just a repercussion of the carbon project. And by having our nation supported by mapping carbon revenues, or having maps supported by carbon revenues, it's brought more opportunity for our First Nations beyond what we could have even imagined, quite frankly. And you know, to be able to sit at the table with government, with other NGOs, um, with corporate fisheries, commercial fisheries, sorry, is, is a really big deal for First Nations in Canada. And I think Elise touched on government a bit as well. And, you know, I would say one thing to understand is in the, in the landscape of Canada is quite interesting for First Nations because if you Google Treaty Map of Canada, you'll see that British Columbia is the only province that doesn't have entirely signed treaties in it. And so what that means for our First Nations is that the provincial government um, is required to sit at the table with us and do government to government relations. So treating our government or our First Nations as equal governments to their own. This has happened, like I've mentioned before, the, the nations came together 
in the late 90s and you know have gotten stronger and built more members over time to do government to government relations but that piece in itself has allowed us to maintain direct consultation for offset protocol for any kind of program or system that's going to affect our projects. Uh, British Columbia is right now looking at putting in an output based pricing system into the province. It's actually being released on April 1st of this year. And we have been at the table with province to have our say in, in this program and how it should be built and, and to be able to advise how we want to approach it because we don't intend to approach the system as a traditional um, offset seller might and sell large quantities to whoever asks and you know, want to work with buyers to also educate them on you know, what they can do in terms of indigenous involvement in reconciliation. Of course, not make it a requirement. We don't expect every industry buyer to, to make changes in terms of indigenous peoples, but to just learn and educate. And, you know, working in the role that I have, it is so often that I hear industry saying, well, we don't know how to start. Like, where do we start? You know, how do we, how do we even reach out to a group? Um, you know, is there language we need to use and questions like that? So I think it's our opportunity and we know, well, we know it's our opportunity to stand, stand forward and say, well, here's some avenues that you could take to do that. Um, you know, in terms of FPIC education, UNDRIP, DRIPA is well included in that. But, but yeah, that's a big piece of it. Um, as well for tangible, Results. I, I mentioned the Coastal Guardian Watchmen. You know, I'd, I'd say the grizzly bear ban hunt would be a, definitely a tangible result of, of the program because the Guardian Watchmen just having such a big role in terms of documenting and um, getting data over time and the number of years that were used to put that data together. And something that we're working on now, uh, which is, is quite fascinating, is we're actually working on a blue carbon methodology. So we're working with a, a local project developer in order to create this. And so it might not be quite tangible yet, but hopefully that uh, draft is done by the end of this year and we'll see projects developed in communities over the next few years. And in reality, this is entirely funded by offset sales. So again, there's not um, other industry or investors playing within this. And so you know, we intend to develop projects under that same light and to be able to, again, kind of stand on our own two feet. Um, again, not something you'll see in other parts of Canada. Where there are treaties signed in other provinces, those First Nations don't have the door open with our governments to say, hey, this is some initiatives that we'd like to work on with you to benefit our communities perhaps to also benefit industry. And so again, that's something that's really big in British Columbia and it's really given us the footing to, to fully own our offset projects and to be consulted on protocol and policy and, and what the move forward steps look like. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's uh, really great, Danny. Thank you. So, and you know, I think uh, the government component of this is absolutely critical. Um, and uh, you know, just from your perspective, at least, what are you seeing in terms of the government of Mexico, either at the you know state level or um, uh, provisional uh, um, uh, level, or, or even at the national level, getting involved? Yeah, so in, in Mexico, the land, the political landscape has been a little bit complicated. Uh, there, there isn't a regulated market yet. Uh, it's in development. It's been in development for, for a few near, years now. It's, it's very necessary, to be honest. I, I see it as something very important so that we can also send like signals no, to, the, to the voluntary carbon market. No? What, what's going to happen in the regulated market is going to impact uh, hopefully positively in the voluntary carbon market, but we we don't have that clarity yet. It's been it's been a process. It's advancing. It, it passed from the pilot phase, and now it's going into the more it's setting the rules down of what what this uh, emissions trading system at the national level is going to look like. No, so there there hasn't been that much clarity. Um, there hasn't been clarity at the moment because there are no rules yet. No, and so. Uh, that's made it a little bit hard to navigate, but what we see is that different uh, initiatives m coming through. No, first at the uh, at the state level, there's a number of initiatives of creating local um, emissions trading systems for uh, state. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how many states there are now with uh, with its own system, but it's it's growing quite a bit in in in, in different states in the in the country. What's going to be interesting to see is how they're going to connect with the the national level system. Um, so while all this is still in development, the, the voluntary carbon market is what has taken a lot of momentum in, in the country, and that's principally motivated by private sector uh, investment and interest in 
compensating emissions, either nationally, including in Mexico, companies that are interested in voluntarily compensating their, their emissions, uh, but also uh, largely driven by the by the international uh, international actors. No, so the the voluntary market is what has been um, uh, motivating the market in Mexico, and we've seen a num a huge amount. Like within 2019, when we started in this in 2024, the amount of actors in Mexico that are working on uh, carbon projects has grown exponentially. No, and I think. We can, we, we've heard of moments where uh, communities receive five different project developers to pitch a specific project. No, the, the interest in Mexico is super high. Um, there's also, there, and that's led also to some bad practices. I think there, there, it's known in Mexico that there, there are uh, bad, uh, co uh, bad projects out there, more in terms of like the how the contracts are developed, how are the kind of agreements that exist with the community, no? And so the government has, from what I understand, uh, has been alerted to this fact and the current uh, government is very much focused on, on, well, protecting these communities. The problem is that uh, we see that there's not enough understanding within the government to, to handle that properly. Um, there is an attempt to to develop a set of rules for the, the, the voluntary carbon market which uh, Mexico is also going through a transition in administration, so we don't think it's going to like result in something concrete yet. But there's definitely that intention, and what I see is that um, in Mexico, the, the market is still developing. No, The actors with it, within it are still developing. That's something that in, in actually I'd like to highlight in terms of the projects that one of the the tangible results that is not a number as such, but it's more like a social impact of these projects is like the level of maturity that the projects that we've been working with have reached in terms of their understanding of the market, of these projects. Like it does take at least two years in some cases to get to the moment where you're actually producing these credits and it requires a number of steps to get to that moment, a number of, of stepping stones, no? And I think that understanding has allowed to give a little bit more confidence at the project level, um, which is which has been critical. No, like these are completely new projects for many forest communities. No, that we've we're, we're talking about market mechanisms that, mm, in, including there's still there's still terminology that I think have, are very fur, far away from the reality that we're seeing on the ground, like spot the spot market or like futures contracts. That's not the kind of thing that many communities on the ground will be like are, are aware of but we're going in that direction we're going towards like a market a market terminologies market systems being more a understandable at, at community level I think it's one of the challenges that we still need to to make sure that we we can achieve but this level of maturity and understanding these projects is something that we've managed to to reach in communities it's, we're still growing it but it's what's lacking, perhaps, at a, a government level. This, uh, in terms of understanding of how it works and how not to uh, make it an obstacle. Like so, that these rules, these new, uh, I, the, the the idea of trying to protect these projects also don't come as a hindrance to them. No, so I think it's a difficult balance at the moment. What, what I truly believe is what is needed is like more conversations, more of these kind of uh, panels to, to talk about the, the challenges on the ground, the realities that we're, we're seeing, the good and the, and the bad. Yeah. Um, so that's maybe where, yeah, I went a little bit around then. <laughs> that yeah. question. Yeah, it's, it's all good. <laughs> so uh, Rosendo, you know, one of the, the key focus is I'm sure everybody in this room has probably, you know, heard the word integrity or, or you know, that you know, integrity is, is the, you know, key of any of these offset projects. So when you guys think about integrity and, and involving, you know, um, putting that into and translating that to your investors, like um, maybe you could walk us through kind of what, what that means to you guys and how you go about that process. Okay, that's a very good question. Just because um, from our experience, in order to ensure integrity for the projects that we work with, we need to work very heavily on transparency, but also communicating um, 
and it goes uh, across the board. Um, transparency across the board and communication across the board. What I mean with, uh, with that is that uh, if we want the community to fully understand what they are getting into by participating in the voluntary carbon market, uh, you need to be transparent with your intentions in, 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 in the first place, but also what, uh, with what they are trading in this case. Um, because as Elise was uh, pointing out is that for, for many communities, it's kind of a weird concept uh, to be able to sell something that you cannot um, touch with your fingers or uh, that you cannot own. I mean, you can own it, but you cannot have it physically. So basically, um, that's when communication can, comes into place because you need to be able to communicate all of those concepts that are, uh, for people that is not highly educated, very hard to comprehend. Um, so basically, sometimes we need to simplify those concepts. We need to work um, around uh, the concepts and sometimes oversimplify um, the information to be more understandable at the community level. And uh, we work heavily on preparing these communities um, to be reviewed and to be checked by someone else uh, from the verification side, but also from the buyer side. Uh, that's when transparency also comes into place because we want to be able to present a project that is uh, real, but also a project that is attractive to buyers and to, and to investors. Um, so transparency and communication work very, very close, closely uh, in order to present integrity of the projects. And also you have to have the ethical component. You need to respect the community's own um, governance system and also their cultural values. And all of these things that um, are very, very specific for, uh, um, for the Mexico context, and I will say for working with indigenous communities, which is the, um, our, our, our main um, know-how that we, that we have as an organization. But uh, we have seen that it's been challenging in other parts of Mexico because the cultural values are different, uh, the way that community sees forests and, and sees uh, their environment um, or their um, forest environment is, is quite different. Um, so we have a very, very uh, wide kaleidoscope of uh, factors and, and things to, uh, to, to work with. And again, um, I, will, I will talk more about this later with, the, with water questions, but integrity comes at a cost, and it comes uh, with a lot of involvement from everyone's, uh, everyone involved, from the, uh, pro from, from the forest owner that needs to understand what, what they are getting into, to the buyer that needs to understand what, what they are buying and, and uh, what they are paying for, basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Danny, I, I, um, I'm gonna kind of combine two different ideas here, but you know, when you think about integrity of the, the projects that you're work on, working on, I'm curious about that. And also, you know, outside of the project, what do people get wrong about these projects? What is it that you have to really kind of educate and, and kind of, um, transfer to them in terms of, you know, what these projects are really about and, and um, how that goes. So it's a, it's kind of a two-part question, integrity and, and communication. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the integrity is interesting because I think I'm working directly for a project and, you know, I work on the policy matters with, directly with nation leadership. So that's, you know, chief of nations and counselors, uh, stewardship directors that, who, again, work and live directly in community. When I think of transparency in the marketplace, you know, a lot of it comes down to that communications piece is, you know, getting, if it's bad media, of questioning how the project was set up. And I think early on we did have some of that, and so we've had to learn from that to say, this is how we need to share our story. And, to, you know, to be able to put that online and say how our projects were set up. I think some people get turned around in the term atmospheric benefit sharing agreement, and that sharing actually happens amongst the nations and not necessarily, or not at all, with the government of BC. Given they're the regulator, they can't obviously own a portion of our offsets. They do purchase our offsets for their own carbon neutrality. Um, that's something that's been made well and known in media as well. But in terms of transparency, again, going back to how are the projects set up, who owns what, where do revenues go? How much of those revenues are committed to what purposes? And, um, and being fully indigenous owned again, you know, I, I wanna go back to that again and again, just because of that government to government piece doesn't exist anywhere else in Canada 
there are not doors open. If, it, if we owned all of our territories as private lands, yes, we could develop under the voluntary market, but we don't. You know, we never sign treaties, so that gives us, again, that footing to do government to government. But it is traditional territories, or as some parts of the government might call it, crown land. I wouldn't say that to our co community leaders, but, um, but nonetheless, that's what the government does call it in their protocol. But uh, in terms of our integrity with our communities, you know, it's a lot of what Rosenda was talking about. And so, you know, looking at a great example is the compliance system coming into place in British Columbia. And so we've spent a lot of time on my team working on how do we look at the differences between voluntary market and compliance market. You know, in the first good portion of the project, it was the sales to the province of BC that carried the project forward. But over the last few years, it's been a massive increase in voluntary sales. And I think that perhaps is some of the criticisms that we've seen in media to voluntary market has really been a huge benefit to us. And, you know, being a standing compliance project and now with the opportunity of this compliance uh, system coming into place in BC, uh, again, just sharing that, educating with our communities, difference between markets. What does this actually mean? You know, I think something that surprises a lot of people is that our projects, we have not sold to oil, gas, and extractive mining in the past. And I think some people might say, well, you could get, you could sell out every single offset. You could get a ton of money doing that. We're very aware of that. It's, uh, it's not that our, our project is not about wanting to necessarily work with those kind of industries. We want to work with the kind of buyers who come to us because they're looking at what's beyond their offset purchase. What else are they doing in their organization to be greener, to work with communities, indigenous or non-indigenous? If we uh, work with a company that's new, we haven't heard of them, we'll also do due diligence. You know, do they have bad relations with indigenous community? We want to know that. And if that's the case, well, what have they done to make a difference and go beyond that? Because the reality is marketplace and industry are changing to make d changes within their systems. They're doing reconciliation, education, or they're just, if, if, and if it's not with indigenous communities, again, what are they doing outside of just that offset purchase? Obviously, under the compliance system, we will be selling to heavy emitters, so that's a bit of a change. And that is where a lot of the education around what does this compliance mandatory regulated system mean for us and how is it going to affect our image in the marketplace. And so you know, we'll maintain some of these same rules and procedures that we have in terms of voluntary sales and, uh, and we will sell to these emitters under the compliance market. But again, it's a lot of education around that. Uh, another piece being is that when there are protocol, so uh, FCOP, Forest Carbon Offset Protocol 1.0, is what we're um, validated it under. And right now, the province is drafting 2.0, which they've been working on for, I'll just say a number of years, but it's been quite a while now. Um, and so we've been had direct consultation in this process to have our words heard. And I don't mean in a way where, you know, government puts out a generic um, call for call for communications and then they educate First Nations on it and then you know they hear some comments and post those out into public. I mean sitting at the table with government directly telling them where we need to see change, where we need to be acknowledged so we can continue the life of our projects and, uh, and the status that we have today. And then uh, in terms of what our Jim was it what are they getting what are getting wrong? What is market yeah, getting wrong? Yeah. Yeah. I would say it's you know I think a lot of people they ask questions right away, which is good. The right type of buyer will ask you the right type of questions, hopefully. But, you know, the fact that we're Indigenous-owned, I think a lot of people assume that there's a ton of other investors that come into play for us. And, um, uh, sorry, I'm blanking a little bit. We, we had gone over this one. Yeah. Um, sorry, yes. So, you know, the ownership being one piece, but also who I work for. So I work for the Graper Carbon Credit Limited Partnership that's owned by the nation. So the nation set up a business corporation. That's how the LP that I work for stands in today. And so there's a bit of confusion sometimes of people thinking, you know, maybe that we're just a generic broker or that we want to do all of our sales through other sales partners. And we do have a network of people that we work with that sell for us, but we also sell directly. And I think a lot of times people just investors and, uh, Maybe some of the, we call them carbon cowboys. Some of those offers you've probably heard of in communities where, you know, community signs off on something, don't realizing that they're giving away most of the revenues. And, you know, that's something that Elise had mentioned and I hear a lot of times in the marketplace. And it's hap I'm very happy and proud to say that's not the case with us. Again, we're 100% Indigenous owned. I work for a, an entity owned by the nations. And, uh, and we're not looking to enter into those kind of partnerships. We do our own sales in-house as well as we do work with partners in the marketplace. Um, so that's one big piece. 
And I think as well, just you know, generally speaking, we are a, a forest offset project, but that doesn't mean that it's only about the trees sequestering the carbon. The project goes beyond so much more of that in terms of co-benefits. And you know, I didn't touch on this under benefits, but you know, the reality through the alliance of nations that we work for and offset revenues, you know, we've seen communities develop ep economically since you know, the late 90s when the alliance started in terms of more people returning to the communities that left where people are going outside the community to get education and then returning to bring that education back to community. And in terms of First Nations people in Canada, I think the story we hear a lot of times, people leave their community and never go back. You know, I'm in my own sense guilty that the community I'm from is in Saskatchewan, but I live out on the west coast of BC. And I'm lucky enough to be able to work with First Nations on the coast myself, right, in that, in that role. But again, um, some of the misconceptions people forget about is you're not just buying a forest offset. The monies are going back to community. That's, that's my job is to take in all the revenues and then literally distribute them directly to the finance department of each community. And um, you know, I'm very proud to be able to say that, but it goes so much beyond just the forest sequestration and tr trees of carbon. It, it, it's about community and reconciliation is a big piece of that. And that's what I think about a lot in my work is that the work I'm doing and the monies go back to to initiatives that provide towards reconciliation, getting people back out on the land, reconnecting with their culture. In some cases, you know, people return to community, they don't know anything about their culture, and that's okay, that's not, that doesn't matter. It's about having these programs available, available for people to take on that learning and actually have real opportunities within their communities where they don't have to leave. Um, I'll leave it there. Yeah, that's great. I mean, there's such an um, interesting human dimension that comes out in, in your, um, in your explanation and stories. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, you know, Elise, from, from your standpoint, you're, you're developing something that's uh, commercially viable, but um, you're also trying to maintain integrity. You're also trying to help uh, the communities. You have a lot of um, balls to juggle, all three of you do. So, um, you know, as you, like, what is it like outside of the communities that people kind of get wrong, or, or are they just not appreciating um, when you try to explain what you're trying to do with an offset project? Um, no, I, in, I was inspired by what you were mentioning. I mean, it's it's very um, the social component of uh, forest credits are absolutely are, are key. No, that's I mean the the reason behind were. The, the carbon credits, it's, it is to conserve the forest, but it's, it's dual, no? It's to conserve the forest and to support local communities that have, ha, that are marginalized in, in many parts of, of Mexico, no? So uh, the social component is absolutely uh, necessary and n maybe it's not that people don't get, uh, get it, it's not that people get it wrong, it's more like uh, realizing the reality of, of the day-to-day -day of these projects, I think, is perhaps something where we need to talk more about. Um, it's uh, the, the integrity. It's, it's interesting to be here in the North American carbon world and to listen. To, uh, many of our conversations are focused on integrity. How do we, how do we prove more and more and more uh, the integrity aspect? And I get it completely. It's absolutely necessary for, for the market to grow in a confident way for people, for buyers to... Uh, to confidently use the credits in a way that they they can compensate their carbon emissions, but that though, though I do feel like in the last few years that the expectations of the market have risen considerably. No, and we have new rules that are being uh, discussed. No, in these kind of forums that are absolutely important and are giving confidence to the market. But we have to think of what are the implications on the ground and what is it. We can't change what like immediately. The, the, the rules of the, not rules of the game, but we definitely have to make it an adaptive process. No, these, um, the social aspect of these projects is what we need to also uh, safeguard. No, we, we, and I think the Climate Action Reserve has a number of, uh, of social safeguards, environmental safeguards that go in, the, in that direction and we're following them. Uh, but also in terms of like these expectations of the market, we have to take into account that there are social processes that, t that are behind these carbon credit projects, and they take time. And I think we, the, the expectations are coming in a very rapid, uh, in a very quick, um, uh, in a very quick way. And we have to see how we can adapt to these new market uh, 
conditions, these new market expectations, without that impacting uh, on the community or, or like that the cost uh, that the cost is solely put on the community. No, I think it has to be distributed uh, appropriately um, because new these new uh, expectations need to be translated on the ground. And, I, and I, as Rosendo was was mentioning. Uh, there, th th this kind of the communication about these projects is true. Some, we do need to simplify certain terms. We're not going to talk about future contracts in, in uh, assembly of people that don't necessarily have, um, like even in some cases, secondary education or primary education. So, so we, we have to see, we have to make sure that the gap between uh, what's happening in the market and what's happening on the ground doesn't get any bigger because we need to we need to remember what these projects are are for also no so i think it's important that we we have realistic uh, like expectations of how the 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 market is going to translate into on the ground uh, practices and keep the commu and the communication is, is absolutely important i think that's where uh, organizations and different actors that are working directly with communities have an important role to translate that in a transparent way, in a in a, a way that the, the communities can trust what's going on in the market uh, is being appropriately uh, translated at a at a project level. Yeah, that's great. So we have about ten minutes left, and I'd like to leave some some time open for questions. I have one more, and then I'll open it up. So, um, and that is on the registry side. Um, you know, obviously, um, ICBCM and <clears throat> other entities are trying to upgrade um, standards for, for offsets. And I'm just um, curious from your standpoint, um, you know, Rosendo, like how you're seeing that and what impact that might be having. Yeah, um, I'm pro-integrity. I think that it has, it, it will add a lot of value to the, to the offsets. However, uh, there needs to be will from, from the buyer side to pay for, for, that, for that integrity because it takes time to build integrity into the projects and also it requires involvement from everyone in, um, um, developing the project from the, uh, pro uh, from the forest owner to the project developer. And sometimes uh, it is harder to create integrity I mean, it, it, with the Mexico Forest Protocol, it's very easy just because it has all the uh, social and environmental safeguards. But if we want to bring these projects uh, from what the, uh, what the standard says to what the um, Integrity Council uh, wants from, this, from, from these projects, there need to be uh, steps to be taken. And also, we need um, pretty much to involve the people into um, getting convinced on that, that this will be an, that these steps will be beneficial for them in the long run. So basically, um, if we want to prove that the, pro the, the projects are um, integral and also transparent and have enough communication and have all of this added value, we need to be able to um, invest the money into, into creating that, but also have the buyers be willing to pay for, for this added value of the, of the carbon offsets. Uh, and again, I'm pro-integrity. Uh, and I think that it's gonna uh, it's gonna weed out all the bad projects from the good projects, but also um, there 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 is uh, a need from at least from the forest owners' per perspective. There, 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 we need signals from the market that this is gonna happen and this these credits are gonna have a benef uh, a benefit in the future. Yeah, that's great. So um, I would like to open it up to questions, and um, I think we do have a, a few. Um, if you could just wait for a second for the microphone, so. Um, you can uh, can do it uh, whichever way you want to go. We'll get to both of you, um, please. It, it, it should. Yeah. <laughs> that works. Hi, go. Mark Den, Carbon International. Thank you so much for all three of you on the panel. Um, that's really interesting insight, actually, into what it's like on the ground working in these projects. Um, I notice the title does include carbon revenue, so I want to ask a question about numbers here. And so to the extent that you're able to tell me, <laughs> can you tell me today, um, Rosendo and Elise, what you're getting in the voluntary market per ton of carbon, and what you anticipate that number being if the existing Mexican ETS uh, goes real? 
in the next 12 months. So the difference between those two numbers. And Danny, if I could ask a similar question to you, what, what are you getting today per tonne in the voluntary market? And then if the British Columbia system materializes, do you have a picture of the different amount that you would have per tonne if you went to compliance sales? <laughs> Tricky question, <laughs> but not tricky. It's just like it's a, it's always talking about the prices. <laughs> a little, it's difficult, no. But what we're what we're following, in fact, is the market indexes that are publicly available. That's that's also been something super hard. In 2019, there was no market index available for us to to launch the project. Um, but we, uh, fortunately, we've been able to migrate towards that though, those market indexes and, and the. The one that currently, I think, mo matches most the type of projects that we're developing in Mexico uh, under the Climate Action Reserve that are carbon removals uh, related to forest management and restoration is the S&P Platts uh, Index. So I think that's one of the that's what the um, one of the key indicators that that uh, we're following. And ooh, the Mexican the emissions trading system. I honestly have no idea. The thing is, uh, we there at, the, at this moment there's no signals that we can obtain even you no know, from the federal federal level. From the subnational level, the um, there there are carbon taxes you no know, that are being developed. I, at the subnational level, there are indexes and in, uh, or there's more like clear signals from the market. Uh, Querétaro uh, has a, a, the highest uh, carbon, uh, the, car the, the highest tax, and in, in that case, it means that it's the highest carbon credit uh, also uh, uh, price. No? So uh, at the moment, I can't remember how much it is, but it's, it's definitely, uh, there's a range the, at the levels of uh, the states that are kind of giving us an indication of, uh, mm, at, at least at the state level, how much the carbon credits could be costing, but national level at this stage, I, have, I wouldn't even be able to put a number to it. <laughs> yeah. I, I will be more open uh, answering the question. Uh, we have been able to sell the credits between 14 and $15 um, dollars per, per credit. However, we know, we, we, we know this, um, uh, everything comes to the cost of producing that credit. And if it's more expensive to produce that credit than to sell it, then we are losing money. So basically, we know that uh, our cost of producing a credit is $11, just because we are paying fair wages to the, to the community members. We are performing a lot of activities uh, within the forest, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that, that becomes very expensive fairly quickly. Um, I mean, we would love to see prices of 30 35 in the in the um, uh, ETS. However, it's very complicated that we will see that. And if you add that to the fact that uh, forestry projects will only be able to contribute to 10% of the total volume of the market, then I think that we will have to judge at the moment uh, if it makes sense for us to transition towards the ETS or if we only reserve part of the credits to be sold in the ETS because um, that's, that's, that's how it's configured. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, in terms of Canada and our, our projects, um, in the voluntary market, we do pricing on volume based. So, you know, if you're coming and you're buying, you know, 1,000 or under, we're looking at about $30 per ton. But if you're coming in and you're buying 300,000, um, you know, we ideally don't go below 15. We have in the past, depending on the type of buyer and if we've sold to them in the past. Um, but that's roughly kind of in between those numbers, I would say. Um, I think we average out right now at about $21, and that's through all sales through like the last about year and a half, or out about an average of 21, when you look at all those volume-based sales together. And then in terms of compliance, um, I, as a seller, I'm quite excited for the compliance market because you know the price per ton in, of carbon in BC in 2023 was $65. And in this, this year, it's $80. So what we've been to, told to expect is about a 20% decrease or discount off of that number. And so that'd be about 40 something dollars, I believe. And you know, that's, an exceptional, that's an exceptional price per ton given the, what we've seen in the voluntary market. You know, that said, I would add that we are still looking at you know, keeping a volume specific for voluntary buyers. We don't want to leave the voluntary market, but that's just because we have partnerships. We have you know, standing agreements and people we want to maintain working with on the voluntary side. But, but yeah. That's what we're looking at. That's great. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. 
Hello, this is Pedro Morales from GLC. Uh, as you recall, yesterday we were precisely speaking about the regulations that are that Semen that is trying to negotiate or enforce. And one of the main uh, uh, concerns with the Mexican federal authority is uh, that the developers do not abuse uh, the indigenous communities or land or, or landowners. However, what I have seen in drafting many agreements that, as you know, we have been drafting agreements since 2010 and many of that has been done by trial and error, is not abuses by developers, but abuses within the communities themselves. Uh, unfortunately, what we have seen in many agreements with the communities established that a certain percentage of the, of the profits will be uh, 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 used by the communities for certain uh, social purposes. But what we have seen in practice with these agreements is that many times in uh, communities, the leaders of the communities or the governing bodies will take the money and it's not possible to enforce that uh, in, uh, in Mexican uh, courts. So many times you will see, when the last time we have seen a leader of an indigenous community with a Ferrari, which was not able to get it out of the, of the, uh, of the community because of the roads, and the people were not getting any money there. Unfortunately, in those cases, the developer has no legal standing uh, to proceed against these people. The ones that have legal, legal standing would be the members of the community, but of course they do not have their, uh, the social or economic resources to do so. So I want to know in your experience, uh, what have you been thinking about probably establishing a more stringent clause in agreements, like establishing a, some trust fund or something like that, which will be much more transparent than the usual uh, requirement of these communities uh, uh, destining a certain percentage of the of the revenue for certain social purposes. Okay, uh, Rosendo, you want to take that, and then we'll wrap yeah, up. Yeah, that's a very interesting question, and Mexico is quite diverse. Uh, it has a lot of uh, different ways of thinking across Mexico. Uh, I think that we're very fortunate because in Oaxaca, governance is very very strong. We haven't faced these issues uh, at least in Oaxaca. We have seen these potential issues in other parts of Mexico. Uh, basically, what we do is we focus heavily on informing the community, and we need to have consensus from the community in order to be able to work with them. If we see, um, I mean, and this is something that we decided to do um, because of bad experiences in the past. Um, if we see uh, social unrest or um, something that will indicate that the funds will not be correctly used by the community, we just decide not to develop the project there. Um, I mean, that's, that's a safeguard we, we take, and we know that it can be seen as us impeding the, the advancement of, of, the, of the market in Mexico, but uh, we prefer to not create uh, problems in the long run for, for these communities than having a community that will have a lot of money that will not be uh, wisely invested. Um, so basically, that's one thing that we do, but uh, with the communities that we are uh, developing projects with, we have been uh, putting some rules um, as, if there's, as if these were uh, government-funded projects. Um, we, we make the differentiation. Uh, this is not a, a, a government-funded uh, project, but you need to apply certain rules for the use of, of the funds. Um, I mean... Uh, talking about um, uh, trust funds and etc., it's kind of hard for communities, especially in Oaxaca, to to be trustable of banks and the banking system. Um, I think that Oaxaca is one of the states with the lower uh, credit uh, score, and, and 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 I mean, it's not uh, credits uh, in in Mexico, especially in Oaxaca, are not widely used. Um, so there is uh, this misunderstanding on how the banking system works uh, from the communities. So basically, we prefer to set the rules for the community to use the money, and we know that there is a gap that needs to be covered in, in terms of uh, financial education, but that will take time, a longer, a longer time actually, to cover than just setting the rules and, and having them apply those rules. And we know that uh, having um, trust funds and everything can, can come up at, at a later stage in the, in the in the community, but there is a lot of education that needs to, to happen within the community to be able to, to get to that. 
Thank you very much. Um, we're just a little bit over. I did hear that the panel next to us gave a loud uh, round of applause, <laughs> but this one is so much better than that one. So um, I just want to thank um, our panel, Elise, Danny, and Rosendo. Um, please uh, give it up for our panel. Thank you.